They dynamited away over 400,000 tons of rock. A sculpture of unusual size. It would be for the whole nation. The incredible engineering accomplishment. From a sculptor who was larger than life. He was genius. A guy like that just doesn't quit. The danger. So they're hanging in midair. And the heartbreak. They had to abandon it, dynamite that head they'd already largely made. How an army of men managed to face the nation. You adapt, you overcome. Carving Mount Rushmore. I'm Stuart Varney, and this is American Built. After World War I in Europe, Americans were ready for some domestic adventure. People had more money in their pockets and more time on their hands than ever before. But to go sightseeing, they needed a sight to go see. The Black Hills of South Dakota. This land is a mesmerizing moonscape, filled with color and mystery. The Black Hills, it's a truly remarkable and beautiful mountain range. It's the kind of a road when you're going through the mountains, you don't just drive through it, you want to stop and get out. But in the Roaring Twenties, there was no place in the Black Hills to stop. Doan Robinson wanted to change that in a big way. Doan Robinson was a state historian for South Dakota, and he just had this idea that tourism was going to be a big, you know, industry. And he thought, we have all these wonderful sites in the Black Hills, so what can we do to get more people to come? And he thought that the Black Hills somewhere, these beautiful big granite outcrops would be a good place to carve a sculpture. The section known as the Needles was Robinson's first choice. These eroded granite pillars were already a tourist draw. And he had an idea that people could you know, drive through there and see um, Western figures, you know, like Kit Carson, you know, cowboys and Indian type. People like Calamity Jane, Wild Bill Hickok, Red Cloud, and others. To pull off his giant tribute to America's West, Robinson needed a sculptor with a big American vision. Mount Rushmore is an American story. Americans like to conceive major projects and build them and make them happen. Robertson approached Laredo Taft, who designed the Columbus Fountain in DC, and Daniel Chester French, who designed the Lincoln Memorial. But an urban monument is a very different beast from a remote mountain. Robertson got wind of a massive carving underway on Stone Mountain in Georgia. Stone Mountain's a Confederate memorial to Confederate soldiers. The sculptor on that ambitious project was Gutson Borglum. Gutson Borglum was a very patriotic gentleman, also a, a big thinker. He studied under Auguste Rodin, was of course known for the thinker. So he begins to make art that's larger than life. He always believed that American art should be larger than life. Doan Robinson knew he had his man, but Borglum was busy on Stone Mountain until suddenly he wasn't. The Daughters of the Confederacy were the commissioning people for that sculpture, and Borglum and the Daughters did not necessarily get along very well. Uh, the split was anything but amicable. The Confederates ended up blasting Borglum's work off Stone Mountain and starting over. So luckily, that did free him up to come here. You know, their loss was our gain. The excitable Borglum was totally on board with Robinson's idea of a Western theme carved in the needles, as long as it wasn't a Western theme, and it wasn't in the needles. The sight of needles simply, simply wouldn't work at all. It's not that the rock is bad, but there's so many fractures that the rocks end up looking like needles, which does not give you a solid mass of rock to put a sculpture in. So the two men hunted through the Black Hills for a carvable surface. He was looking for a large enough ridge line to uh, encompass an ever-growing idea, and he wanted it to be made out of Harney Peak granite. They found what they were looking for in Keystone, South Dakota. On a tip from the locals, Borglum and Robinson scouted a mountain called Rushmore. Well, Mount Rushmore, that granite, 
It's like three millimeter diameter crystals over a billion year old rock, very durable. So it makes a marvelous medium for a mega sculpture. And they rode up on horseback and upon viewing the ridge line, Borgum knew that was the one. But there was one very big drawback to Rushmore. It was still quite remote out here. The roads um, to Mount Rushmore were barely existent. According to Guts and Borglum, he wrote many pages on how bad the road was. <laughs> and they had to even do a little road work themselves. And before he started carving, Borglum expanded Robinson's regional theme to a national one. Oh, we could do, you know, presidents and and it would be for the whole nation. So he chose presidents. He chose them and chose why they would be chosen. Washington and Lincoln were the obvious national choices. Borglum chose Jefferson for a surprisingly local reason. Thomas Jefferson chosen for not the Declaration of Independence, but the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the nation. The Louisiana Purchase also added South Dakota to the Union. So Borglum set out to carve the father of the country, flanked by the man who expanded it and the man who held it together. Each of the three faces would be 60 feet tall. But not everyone was on board with the patriotic plan. There were local religious groups that believed, why should a human being touch something that God made? To sell the idea to the locals and to raise some much needed funds, Borglum planned a grand dedication, but he was not easy to get to it. And that first dedication, there were old cars that were, you know, unable to make it up the hill and getting stuck on the route up here. Of course, the, what did the visitors do? They just got out and walked, hauled their coolers with them. He took all of the men to work on the roads, and one of the workers said, I looked over, and there's Gutson at his age packing rocks right with the rest of us. In a major PR coup, Borglum convinced the current president, Calvin Coolidge, to show up. You know, the president of the country needed to come see the presidents where they were going to be placed. <laughs> the headgear was Coolidge's idea. But despite the high profile endorsement, there was nowhere near enough money to pull this off. Sure, money was a big problem, of course. So donations were taken from around the, around the nation. Borglum raised money however he could. He even started a children's donation campaign. They actually had a um, milk money donation system where they'd go ask kids to donate nickels and dimes and quarters and pennies. So they got the school kids, particularly in South Dakota, excited. But the mighty mountain came up against an unlikely competitor. Actually, the yo-yo was invented right in that same time period. So kids were spending money on a yo-yo instead of giving money to the sculpture. Got to have a yo-yo, right? Um, so that funding kind of dried up. Yes, that darn yo-yo. <laughs> Faced with inadequate infrastructure, an inexperienced labor pool and insufficient funding, Borglum did what any larger-than-life visionary would do. He got to work. They, of course, began to realize right away, you can't chip at a mountain like this and remove what amounts to 35 or 40 foot of rock with a hammer. That's not going to work. 